Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Tuba People TV, where we talk about Arnold Jacobs all of the time. Puddles and I are here in Colorado Springs, Colorado, at the uh, lovely home of Sandra Bell. Sandra, thank you so much for having us in. Thanks Sandra is the, uh, um, the organizer, founding organizer and host of the Colorado Trombone Festival, which is very successful. And uh, you also teach at the uh, University of Colorado at Colorado Springs. And you also had some lessons with uh, Arnold Jacobs. That's true. I wonder, when, did, when, when was the, your period of study with, with Mr. Jacobs? I studied with him in 1991 as I prepared to enter a doctoral program, and then I took some lessons after I started my doctorate. So over the course of a year, 1991 through 92. Do you remember uh, your first encounter with Jacobs? What was that first lesson like? It was very inspiring. Um, it was it was a big step to get there and to fly there and didn't know what to expect, but I just felt like I was in the presence of greatness. I, I still remember his, his voice, the tone of his voice was so resonant and rich and his vocabulary, it was so elevated that I hadn't really experienced people talking like that. So I felt like I was in the presence of someone really great and I was just and I he when I left I was playing with so much more ease than I had ever played before that I knew I had to come back. Do you remember what he did uh, from that first lesson to get you to that point of playing with more ease? Well um, he he had some of his breathing gadgets sure. um, so I, he we worked a lot on breathing over the, the course of lessons, but um, it was really thinking about what you wanted out here and picturing in your head what you wanted to come out the bell. And I that just really resonated with me because I had spent a lot of time under the hood analyzing, you know, what my tongue was doing, what my embouchure was doing, and it was it had created some fear and paralysis and it was very freeing and it felt right to me that seemed to be a healthy way of playing. I, I remember my own experience maybe my, my first lesson or maybe my second lesson he was getting to he was getting me to do something that was totally a 180 that I was taught when I came from Oregon to Chicago and it was a very much um, one of those light bulb moments I thought this is not hard. It's it is actually easy, and I got this big smile on my face, and he became very stern with me. He thought I was laughing at him, but it sounds like it sounds like you had a similar experience in terms of, of really um, experiencing the ease right away. With uh, with uh, sounds like maybe he was working with your air to get you to use more air. Mm -hmm. Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. um, do you remember anything just in particular with regard to that? Maybe one of the gadgets or how he was getting you to use your air kind of to free you up? I don't know if he did this the first lesson or not, but um, one of the things, um, well, there were several things he did, but with the Voldyne unit, um, he would put it right up to my mouth and have me, I remember he would say, suck with velocity. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and so then I'd shoot the puck up and then I immediately I would play. And so I was just so full of air and then there was just, it just came out. It was just so easy. Um, then he also had this thing, um, I had like a needle on it that he put to a breath meter. And mm -hmm. then he had me yeah. breathe from my throat and mm -hmm. then the meter didn't do anything. And then he had me breathe from my lips and the thing sh shot up. So. We did, I think the very first lesson, we did the ball. Um, the spirometer, mm -hmm. or the, uh, was it the, the breath builder? Mm, the breath the builder. The ping pong ball. Right. Yeah. And then, after a few lessons, we didn't really use that anymore. So, um, we used mainly the Voldyne. Did you feel like you had gotten a, f a good full range of, of motion, of capacity? Mm-hmm. With... Mm -hmm. And he, um, I mean, we worked a lot on the retake breaths going back to the starting point. 
we worked a lot on just having that initial breath to take your time on that initial breath and get as comfortably full as you can and then let the music take over and then let the retake breaths go back to the starting point. And that was new to me um, because I didn't always yeah. take. Also, keeping the chest really elevated, that was that was new, um, really working on that. Um, it's something I use with my students of just really feeling the breath at your lips, breathing ho with a moist and feeling that sensation and not over opening, but feeling it at, at your lips. Yeah, I'm breathing from the lips. Mm -hmm. I remember him talking about that quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Just the whole, when you put the focus of the air at the throat or at the roof or at the teeth even, there's more friction and there's mm -hmm. less efficiency. Mm -hmm. But from the lips, Right. Really, right. the mechanism. So I use that all, all from beginners all the way through professionals when they take lessons because it, it's just, it works. Yeah, that's good. Sandra, in terms of the, in terms of, uh, the breath, did he, did he give you any catchphrases, anything yeah. that, that uh, you remember? That air was free, and so you should just use it and waste it, and you could breathe as much as you wanted, not to worry about trying to play a really long phrase if you were getting it to the end of your breath just breathe more that often and um, I thought that was very freeing and I use that a lot my students always laugh that you know it doesn't cost anything so just <laughs> might as well use it exactly you take it in and let it out that's right what about um did he ever work with you on embouchure or anything of that nature? well he um that was one of the things I remember from our first lesson is the hope that I left because I had been told by my previous teacher that I was going to have to change my embouchure and he's having me spend a lot of time looking in the mirror and trying to create this perfect embouchure and after that first lesson he said you don't need to change your embouchure and don't let anyone try and change your embouchure. If you're focusing on the sound and your embouchure will naturally do what it needs to do. And so that was very great news. I remember him talking uh, in various master classes about how he, he could work on embouchure he, you know, with a student, but he chose not to most of the time because most of the time it was not an embouchure issue. It was a thought issue mm -hmm. more so, more of where you're placing your thoughts. Um, and then most of the time it was the, the thoughts were not on music or you know, the sound, mm -hmm. similar, mm -hmm. do you remember mm -hmm. that he might have said something similar to you about that, in that regard? He didn't use it like, quite like that, but just that if you're focusing on your sound and what you want it to be, this is naturally just going to react to that. Another thing he said that was really helpful was to have the air way out in front of you, and that's where you should focus, and not at the tongue. So especially when you're working on an articulated passage, if you're focusing on it's out here rather than here, you may for a lot more ease. Yeah, I, it seems uh, f something familiar um, was your, he would tell me your number one job is, well, not number one job, but your job with the air is to get it to the lips. Getting air to the tongue doesn't create sound. Getting air to the lips does create sound. And we also said get it up front. The air needs to be up front. Yeah. That's really helpful. That's mm -hmm. good. Sandra, as far as uh, uh, musical aspects, what, uh, what direction did he, did he take you? Well, I think he's known for just really focusing on what song you want to sing in, through your instrument and putting your emphasis there. And um, he always said to be an actress and to be a storyteller of great sounds and that was just so freeing um, and that our job was first to be a singer and second to be a blower and just to create in your head what it is you want to communicate and then take a breath and and do that let the music take over mm -hmm. did he have you um you know, we're talking about singing in the head. Did he have you practice any conceptualization things, or did he tell you how to do that, or how did he get you to 
Sing in the head, exactly. Right. Had, had you been exposed to singing in the head? No, how, no. So how did he get you to start doing that? I think it was through imagination. He used that a lot. He just needed to imagine. And he would put dollar values sometimes and say, you know, I wouldn't give you five dollars for that. I want a million dollar sound. I want a million dollar tone. And um, so it was mainly through encouraging you to sing and to imagine what I wanted. Did he um, try to have you imagine some other trombonist or singer or instrumentalist and have you imitate that thought or? Mm, I don't remember that. It was just, just, just creating in my head the imagination of what I wanted to sound like. And you were able to do that very well over time. You did that very well for him. That's, that's excellent. I was explaining recently to somebody um, about how it's so important to, to have that. The, the part of the brain that allows a singer to conceive the pitch and the tone color and the, the musicality is the same part of the brain for the brass player, but instead of going down the... Oh, this is the big thing he did. And I, I mean, this has become so much a part of what I teach, I, I kind of forget sometimes that I got it from him, but putting vowel in your sound always getting to the O right away, getting to the AH right away, or in some cases the OO. I, that was a huge light bulb for me and one that I've passed on. Yeah. And, and so many younger players, and even myself, and the, the consonant takes up too much space in your mouth, and so you de-emphasize the consonant and you overemphasize the vowel. Well, for trombonists, that's that's got to be the the real big issue, is because you you have to tongue practically for every note. So there's a big emphasis on consonant, mm -hmm. whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you get away from how do you do that as a trombonist? Get to the vowel, and less less so on the consonant. Well, he introduced me to this too, but playing a lot of technical passages legato. Um, playing it just as beautiful and as lyrical, and then matching that when you added the articulation. But when you sit, he drew a picture of a little T and a great big O. And just seeing that visual just made sense. Um, so using speech. Mm -hmm, using speech. To get where you're going. Yeah, he's real big in, in that, in, in using existing, what we know as people rather than having to come up with something new, mm -hmm. just using existing patterns of speech. Did he have you um, um, buzz mouthpiece, play the mouthpiece so much? A little bit, but he had me do more of the mouthpiece ring. Okay. And and that's something I've been inspired that I, when I went back and prepared for our, this interview today, I realized I'm not doing as much as that I, as I used to, but it did immediately create better resonance by focusing, for some reason with me, I don't know if, he was like this with others, but he likes the mouthpiece ring better than the than the mouthpiece. Okay, yeah. So that worked. That worked for you really well. Mm -hmm. You got uh, pretty pretty immediate mm -hmm. results. Mm -hmm. That's great. Did he put any? Do you remember any? Did he put any restrictions on the? Yes, the, the mouthpiece ring. You can only. He told me only in the middle to low range, where the mouthpiece. He said I could do all over, but he really encouraged me to just play little melodies, Yankee Doodle, all kinds of little tunes on that. Mm -hmm. And so it's very helpful when you're traveling to, to, to buzz on the ring. Yeah, and it's, it's easy to have one at the ready. Mm -hmm. so in your pocket. Yeah, that's really good. Well, great. Thanks a lot for uh, letting Puddles and I come in to your house. Um, Puddles, as always, has instructed me to uh, Present you with a genuine Tuba People TV oh, water thanks. bottle. <laughs> In Colorado, we always need to drink a lots of water, so this will be great. Very Thank low you. humidity here. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's great. It's very dry, so make sure you drink a lot of water to get used to the altitude. Is this, your, is this your first time here to Colorado? Not my first time, but I haven't been here in a while for any, except at the airport. So okay. it's been a while. So make sure you take them to Garden of Gods and different places. Okay. Check on that. <laughs> Done. So Puddles is about ready to burn up, so I, I guess we better say thanks a lot.
Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Very much. <laughs> how, how did the concepts come to you? A lesson at a time, or did things well, filter through? I recorded my lessons, and then I took notes. So even though I maybe only had one lesson with him, I revisited that lesson three or four times. So it became more a part of my thinking and my approach. And it revolutionized the way I teach. I mean, the way I teach is all based on all the concepts I got from Jake. We, we thank Rebecca Lee for that, <laughs> uh, that appendix. Thank you. Bottles thanks you too. Oh, you're welcome, yes, Bottles. Thank you. Especially. Welcome to Colorado. <laughs> Should I be turning this off?